my pleasure today to introduce uh, Nicole Crane. Um, Nicole is one of these other people who's coming home, a former Moss Landing person herself. Um, I've known Nicole for, oh, for, yeah, for a while. Uh, I haven't spent a lot of time walking around Baja, pulling Winnebago's and boats out of the sand and stuff like that. But, um, but it still means I still have to look at a sheet to get her right. Um, Nicole uh, got her uh, bachelor's degree from UCSC. She got her master's right here at Moss Landing. Well, not here, when it was down the hill at Moss Landing. Uh, <clears throat> she then um, got a master's in science education and research at UCSC. Um, Nicole has spent a bunch of time um, around here developing programs at Career College and at NBC. Um, she has a lot of conservation um, ecology. She's faculty at Cabrillo College, where she's been there for, what's it? Um, for a little while. Um, she's also been a senior, senior conservation scientist with the Ocean Society. Um, she's been a director of Sea Lab at CSUMB, or PI for the Sea Lab at CSUMB. Um, and she's been a PI on a number of NSF grants that have to do with science and education and research and, um, and conservation. She's been nominated for a few fellowship. Um, and she's really, her focus has really been on our think stuff she's going to talk about today, other than science and education and conservation. Um, uh, ecology. And I think that's what you're going to focus on today. When she contacted me, she said, I have these two big directions I can go, and I kind of said, you choose. And I think she chose her conservation one to talk about today. So, uh, that being said, I'm going to um, welcome my Nicole Crane here. Um, give us a Thank you. Um, about the issues that these people are facing, and then we'll get into some of the data. We're going to carry 
characterize the reefs and talk about how we're applying that to fisheries management in these islands. So um, we'll, we'll uh, include in all this uh, some of the questions we asked, which was, does reef community structure vary? So it's a big atoll. This is the fourth largest atoll in the world. I'll show you where it is here in just a second. Um, so uh, do, do the reef structure vary, and do they um, uh, cluster in some sort of a specific way? Um, what are the characteristics that define them? What factors are important driving these factors? So we're trying to look at what are the main drivers. And how does subsistence fishing factor into all this? You'll see the big way. Um, and how can these findings be applied to management? So I thought I'd get this slide out of the way earlier. Just, you know, funded it. So we've been funded by a bunch of people. And I want to point out in particular, um, we went uh, rogue this year and we decided to do a mini go go campaign, crowdfunding campaign. Did anybody ever done anything? Uh, have uh, records of uh, 4,000 
years of inhabitants. So they've been there for a long time um, working on the island. So this is not about marine protected areas and places where nobody lives. The two largest ones on the planet, as you know, are places where people have been removed or never were in the first place. So we're talking here about marine management where people are really <coughs> part of um, I have to give you a little bit of background. This part of the world is part of the Compact of Free Association Agreements. So uh, because of World War II, uh, we uh, agreed to work with the Federated States of Micronesia as long as they continue to give us access to their low-lying islands for any military purpose that we would help them out in various ways. Usually that is in the form of our government uh, subsidies and monies. Um, that Compact Agreement is uh, slated to end in 2023. And I can tell you right now that this part of the world is not panic because they've been su uh, supported for many years through the compact. Um, there are several countries lining up um, behind the United States uh, to take over. Um, number one is China, which has now uh, put together an agreement to manage all the fisheries in my community. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure that's a great plan. But, um, we haven't signed yet, but they're pushing for it. Uh, so, uh, what I'm talking to you about here is an approach that really makes tradition with modern science. So we're really trying to inform communities of the data collecting on the ecology of the reefs and the impact of the fishing and mixing it with tradition. So we're not telling them what to do. We do not present plans to these people. We don't go say, here's what you should do. We don't even suggest human resource frameworks. So we don't tell them, you should have a committee for education and a committee for that, for this person on that. We don't tell them anything about what to do. Uh, we emphasize the need for management. We provide the data. And then we provide training to help them inform themselves, uh, in particular, to measure their landed fish. Um, and then we remain available. <coughs> we go back each year to help support them. And um, at the end here, you'll see what they've accomplished. It's really what they've done. Um, so because of the Compact Free Association, all of the state, uh, the YAP state uh, uh, efforts, including the ship, are all um, OSHA approved and regulated. <laughs> 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 This kid's all on the sort of Thank you. 
makes working out there and doing that and stuff really nice. It can happen just like that, really in one day. Um, <coughs> and so what we're talking about here is a, a story that is about eating. So these people are subsistence fishers. They're not doing this commercially. So these are not fish for exports, an important thing to keep in mind. Yes. This is fishing to feed themselves. So they're, they're, not, they're exporting a bit to their families, but not for sale. Um, it's about the food that they eat, which has kept them healthy for many years. But it's also about the food they're eating, which is not making them very healthy. So the <coughs> banana wieners, you remember these things? <laughs> okay. um, this is some seriously nasty food. And they're eating a lot of this. Because this is part of what comes in the form of the compact aid. Some of this nasty food, especially rice grown in California. It's actually hilarious to be out on those islands and see bags of rice from Sacramento. Um, and ultimately, it's about the impact on the reefs. And so this uh, story started when I was invited out there to talk to them about problems with fishing. They said, we're not fishing as many fish. We don't know what's happening. Our reefs are changing. We're not fishing as many fish. Can you tell us what's happening? And can you tell us what to do? And I said, I actually probably can't do either one of those things. But I can bring people in. We can take a look. We can inform you. I certainly can't tell you what to do about that. You're going to have to figure that out yourself. So this is where we were tasked to try to see if you see patterns. And um, so people really have been stewards of these reefs for a very long time, and they know a lot, they know a whole lot more than any of us do about their reefs. So the first thing I did was to pull out from them what they do know, because they don't talk to each other much anymore. There's been a real gap, a generation gap. Um, so um, this is social data. We collect a lot of social data as part of this project, and I'm not going to present many of those today, but we use a grounded theory approach to pull themes from those data to try to figure out what they um, see as their biggest problems, and, um, and match that with what we can see ecologically on the reefs. Um, so here's a, um, some people love these, some people hate them. I kind of, this one's like, you know, I like it. So um, uh, this shows you a little bit about how we're sort of doing an, an ethno-ecological approach to management, where we're combining data that we collect as a science team with data that we're collecting from them and data that they're collecting and providing for themselves as well as for us, so that we can match them too. And the idea here is to improve their food security, to try to enhance reef recovery, and ultimately community stability. Because when you have food problems, and when your resources are falling apart, your community does too. <coughs> so we had to search far and wide. Um, we found the oldest person uh, that we could find in all of the other islands. Uh, Junior and I here, we traveled 500 miles in the Pacific Pines bed. And we found him. He didn't even know how old he was. <laughs> but he remembered World War II. So he's got a path for you. Um, and he told us a lot of incredible stories about traditional management and what they used to do and what they're no longer doing. We interviewed lots of people and <coughs> talked to them about what they no longer do. So we were interested in what they used to do that they no longer do and when they stopped doing it, which we thought might tie with when they started to see some of their declines and when we could see some of their big <coughs> issues. Um, we met with communities, which you'll notice in this picture are usually uh, men. So they, they have a, a very um, sharp distinction between the men and the women. And uh, I'm actually, as a white woman, I'm considered, I think, a eunuch. Because I'm invited into the men's houses, which is not the case with women. You're not going to be in the men's house. Um, but no problem with me. I'm not sure if that was a compliment or, uh, or not. But, um, so we met with lots of people. And the hardest thing was to meet with the women, because the women are often not a part of the scene. So we had to actually seek them out and, uh, and go and ask them questions. But like many of these traditional communities, um, the women do in fact run the behind the scenes. In fact, from behind the scenes, they run in front of the scenes for the most part. For example, they control all the alcohol consumption. So they're in charge of that. So if you misbehave way too much, you're going to get some trouble. Um, the women also do the cooking. So if you want to talk to somebody about fishing, you better talk to them because they're cooking it. So they know, uh, they clean them also. So they know what's happening. They know which fish are, are spawning, which fish are not. They, they know a lot about what's happening fisheries wise. Um, and they also know a lot about everything. Because when the guys are out fishing, these women are talking. And so they have, a, they have their finger on what's going on. Um, uh, there's a lot of really good literature, which I won't go into, about the traditional uh, um, systems of people and the diversity of the ecological systems they work in. So a lot of that work came out of the Amazon. And we've known that many of these uh, ecosystems have been really shaped by humans for a very long time. It's not about being pristine. Right? The Amazon is not pristine 5,000 years ago by any means. It, it people living in it. Probably many more of them live today in some of those places. 
Um, but we forget that they had a very powerful impact on this ecosystem as well. So chapter one here is things have changed. Um, historically, wind direction, and this is some of the stuff we got from the people, wind direction, season, and cultural traditions dictated where and how you can fish. Okay, so the wind is blowing this way, you're in a sailing canoe, you're going to be fishing on these reefs, it's a stormy time of year, you can't go outside the reef because of that, so you can find different kinds of places that you can fish. Six months later, it's different, you're going to fish over here. So you sort of have de facto reserves in a way, right, rotating reserves, because you can only access them at certain times of the year. So that builds in a protection for the fish. Um, also, uh, we had some very powerful taboos. So some uh, organisms, like turtles, need to be brought to a particular island and blessed by a chief. So you can't just go on a turtle and eat it. You have to take that thing all the way to island X, get chief Y to bless it, and take it all the way back home <coughs> and cut it up and distribute it to the pain. So they didn't do that very often. They did it only for ceremonies. That's not happening anymore. So they're killing a lot more turtles than they used to. Um, some fish were only eaten by men, others only by women. So depending on whose party it is, literally, um, they catch different fish. Uh, some fish, such as grouper, could only be eaten by certain families. This is a case-selected fish, many of them. And so this is a built-in protection for that fish. Not everybody can eat grouper. And in fact, the biggest grouper are only a very even fewer family can eat them. And sharks are only eaten by some communities in Ireland. Uh, so here's uh, some turtles. Here's a, a turtle hunter here with his spears. And um, I'm telling you, after eating rice and piano mirrors for a long time, it was really good. <laughs> And they also use the farm clams. And this is a really important source of uh, nutrition for them. This also so cool. is not being done so much anymore. When this fell apart, they went to catch the wild clams and the depleted clam population. So there's a clear tie between these things. Um, clams and beach is also really good. Um, so fish trapping is another way that they uh, used to use a lot. They aren't using as much anymore. Um, these were uh, only placed in certain parts of the reefs and families owned fish traps. So you also had a limited uh, access to the fish with the fish traps. And then a couple more here. This is the, probably the most important one that we found in the outer islands. Um, this was the death. We had carried this coffin on the ship that I was on out to one of the remote outer islands. Uh, this is the death of a high chief. And when a high chief dies, all of the land and reefs that this person is responsible for are shut down for use. You can't go there. You can't use ten fish anymore. And the period of time really is determined by how important that chief was. And sometimes, in this case, there was a paramount chief that passed away, and they said they would close the reefs for 10 years, which for people who don't have you know, many places to fish, that's a lot, because they can't get to the other places to fish. So that's definitely building protection. Okay. Um, so here's an impact that besides the loss of traditions in World War II, um, Ulithi Atoll was a staging area for the Pacific Naval's third fleet, and all the great battles of that region were staged out of the Atoll. 722 ships. I've seen figures of up to 300,000 personnel in that lagoon. 2,000 people that lived there. Okay. So unbelievable impact. Uh, people were moved. But take a look at this. So here's Falala. They built the runway. This was an island that was pretty much denuded of vegetation in order to build this runway. <laughs> this one, here's Magma. This is all Quonset huts. Right, so every single piece of living thing was taken off that island, including the local people. And so this was made into the R&R um, &R, um, playground for the military. So they, here they are. <laughs> on the beach of Wadapak, which is where the Paramount Chief usually is. So this is one of the most important spiritual centers on all of the outer islands. Um, I found out after I started working here that my father actually served in the um, uh, military on an aircraft carrier in Unity Atoll. Something that's my dad. <laughs> 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 um, lots of stuff also uh, underwater. So lots of, you can see lots of stuff that was left, uh, left behind and actually purposely put uh, down after they left. So after the war, money came, new technologies came, chiefs became less powerful. So money began to drive the system, right? It's a really important change. Money began to drive it and less so the traditional systems of governance. With engines, people could fish anywhere at any time. So you have to worry about that wind thing anymore. You stick your engine out, you can fish wherever you want. And so what happened was the sites where there were lots of fish began to be hit over and over and over again. This was still there, there's lots of fish. So you put a lot more impact on those sites. But then, unfortunately for them, fuel became scarce and extremely expensive. It's eight dollars a gallon out there. And these are people that don't even deal in a cash economy. So they don't have access to fuel anymore. So what happened then, after they'd given up their canoes, put all their, their, their uh, resources into engines and boats, they couldn't fuel anymore, now they were a double. And so they began really to fish really close to the villages and use 
to your methods. So nets, spear guns came into the scene here. And you're going to see here just a minute that it's these spear guns. I know this doesn't look like the kind of spear gun that you might use if you're a spear fisherman, but these are really impactful. And they were new, uh, so to speak. And so um, you'll see that a huge percentage of the catch, in fact, Micronesia wide from Guam, um, Anape, uh, and, the, and the CNMI, which is the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas Islands, 70% of the catch is night spear fishing. That's a commercial catch. So it's not just the now and then thing, it just is the main way of fishing. And um, you'll see how it changed. Um, what's going on out there? Also, new kinds of nets came into the scene, which had a big impact. Chiefs became less powerful, and people who owned engines and freezers became the decision makers. Um, this is actually, I know he looks disgruntled here, but <laughs> this is the chief that was the first one to set aside uh, his uh, reefs for management. So the second part that we're going to do is characterizing the atoll. So do the reef community structure, does it vary across the atoll? As you can probably imagine it does, and yes it does. But what are the characteristics that define it? So we did find a couple of things that were interesting and surprising. Do fish communities vary? And what are some of the explanations for those patterns? So these are the data we shared with the community. So here's those sites again. Um, you're not going to remember all these, so I'm not going to expect you to, but what I'm going to be doing on some of these is show you close to human villages, remote, like that. So here, the people are living right here on Palala, right here on Asor, right here on Magmag, and then down here on Federa. Those are the four inhabited islands. And we see a very clear signature of reef problems associated with this island. Um, so uh, because of the remoteness of this place, we uh, have no scuba here, so we do everything by holding. It's good, it's very good shape at the end of the last time. <laughs> this is Michelle here, collecting some data. Um, here's now big door, so I put this up here for Diana, right? <laughs> <laughs> Roadless, we got really excited we found these, so that's very exciting. Um, we're doing some uh, genetic analysis of the fish and some of the corals. This is Peter and Abigor doing rugosity, small scale rugosity, and then collecting benthic data. So we had a couple things we found right off the bat that we real they were concerned about, and we didn't really, actually, we didn't really believe them at first when they told us this. So we sort of said, yeah, well, you know. They said, we have this invasive coral that's taking over our reefs and growing really fast like a weed. And we said, really? Corals really don't usually do that here. But we'll look anyway. We'll see. And they said, there's this place also which is full of poisonous stuff that we think um, is killing us or hurting us anyway. So we went to look at this, and sure enough, we found this, uh, they call it cabbage coral. It's Montipora is the genus. Uh, it's an unidentified species. So, um, we don't really know where it came from. So when we say the word invasive, it doesn't necessarily mean introduced. We actually think it might be from the atoll, but it has found a place and have found a way, given the current conditions, to really do well. It's probably more resistant to warmer waters, um, possibly uh, more acidity, I don't know. But it's something about the conditions are making it good for this coral. And in fact, it does grow very fast. And you can see it, it, it has this sort of, it's a monospecific growth here, and it covers over <coughs> all the other corals and creates habitat that actually isn't good for fish. Fish don't seem to like this stuff very much. Um, and then we also found this coralomorph, which uh, actually Nancy Knowlton was the first to identify this one uh, um, as identical to one sequence in Okinawa, although they didn't actually put a name to it. So it has been sequenced from Okinawa. It is, in fact, very closely related to the one that's been found in Palmyra that is quite toxic. So uh, they were right about this too. And uh, it smells bad when you uh, bring it out of the water and if you rub yourself or touch it when you're sampling, it burns your skin, it's nasty stuff. Um, so we were able to uh, validate their concerns about those two things. Okay, so here's some of the data. Um, here's near villages and here's sort of the uninhabited or remote islands. Remote areas, there's a lot of macroalgae 
And if you are one who digs into Caribbean literature, your, your first impression of macroalgae is that it's evil. It's looking over the leaves, right? I mean, not for the modern day books, but like in the Caribbean, yeah. And not the case, really, and certainly not in the Pacific. Macroalgal dominated communities are quite common in the Pacific. Okay, so we see a definite separation by inhabited and uninhabited. Here is coral morphology. So we also looked at morphological diversity in corals and tried to see if some sites had more diversity than others. And in fact, they do, and you'll see the places where there's montifera, you can see it here, but the red arrows are montifera, again, where diversity is basically very, very low because the montifera has taken over and there's only one kind of coral there. And diversity tends to be higher in these more remote uh, places. So coral diversity has been shown to be linked quite directly with fish. Okay, here is a hierarchical clustering of sites. Um, these are the benthic data, which include uh, everything from coral cover to algal cover to um, uh, macro invertebrates, all kinds of stuff are in this database. And you can see that they cluster really nicely. So the hierarchical clustering is actually, this is two years, I think, 2013 and 2014. And they uh, make these really nice clusters. Um, remote oceanic, human-influenced oceanic, and human-influenced lagoonal. So there's an, an extra category here. So take a look at this for a sec here. Human-influenced oceanic is Falala. Because that's an island that's outside the atoll. It's just outside the atoll. So it's exposed to very different conditions than the ones that are inside the atoll. And you can, you can see that when you characterize the communities. Um, here are the cluster types to characterize the communities. And here we have that montifera dominant. This is a diverse coral. And then turf dominant. And again, you see a clear signature here by the villages. So there's definitely fishing pressure. And, and the main pressure, I'll, I'll give you a spoiler here, gromads. For herbivorous acantharids, uh, the convict tang, and spearfishing. So they're catching, uh, most of the fish they catch in those methods are those little herbivorous fish. And so you're having a, a recruitment problem with the corals, probably is one of the things going on, and uh, more of the turf is building up. Um, this is not surprising to most of you, I'm sure, and that is that as total coral cover increases, rugosity or complexity increases. So rugosity is just having that complexity, right? So this, if you have a more cover, if this is without uh, the Montifera, more cover, you will lead to more rugosity, which tends to correlate with fish, fish like that. So just a couple of pictures of what they look like. The more remote sites look like this. The coral colonies are small. It's kind of an interesting habitat, actually. If you, if you do a, um, any kind of statistics with coral colony size, it's, there's nothing interesting at all, because they're all small, pretty much. So uh, here's a remote site uh, outside the lagoon. Um, here is a uh, remote oceanic site also, so you can see um, it's not as clear a picture, but this is one of the outside turtle islands, similar. Lots of little uh, bits of coral, quite diverse. This is a lagoon site, but not influenced by humans. So it's far from the villages, but facing the lagoon. And you can see a lot of complexity of corals in here as well, with a fair amount of crustos coralline, which are really important, a settlement uh, and recruitment places for young corals. Um, here is a human-influenced non-lagoonal. So this is uh, similar to this one, let's say. Sorry, this one. Very similar to this one, but near humans, okay? So here is without humans, and here is with humans. Right there. So you can see it's quite different, and you can, for sure, you can look at that, and, and it looks like it may be influenced by people. There's eutrophication happening here, everything, and like that. Um, and here is a human influence non lagoonal This is Palala. And here's that high turf. Look at all that <coughs> turf up here. So it's just a few groups of corals and a lot of turf. And this is that fish that they're targeting with those throw nets. Um, it's a really important little fish, and they're catching a lot of it with those throw nets. Um, here is the Montifero dominated. Look at this mess. <laughs> this is this big patches of cabbage coral that are growing everywhere. And uh, here's what it looks like. So um, then we did a uh, clustering of for fish diversity to look to see if the fish diversity, the fish communities <coughs> also cluster like that. And lo and behold, such a lot of your statistics come out. This is Peter's work. And he sent this graph out and said, it works, right? So um, here's 2012. You can see uh, this one clusters by uh, humans but oceanic, humans but lagoon, and remote. And, and so that's 2012, we had fewer data in 2012, 2013, and then 14. And the clusters, besides a few anomalies in here, are pretty consistent. So we feel pretty good about these data, that the clusters are, I think, apply pretty true to what's actually going on. Um, 
And here's what they here's what it is in terms of the habitat. So fish community A, which is the human influence of oceanic, you can see there's some of that montifera. Here's some hard coral, other hard coral, lots of turf. That's the light green, just turf, turf everywhere. Here is a B here is the human influence in the lagoon where the montifera starts to really begin to dominate. <coughs> and then here are the more remote sites where other corals, other hard corals and um, CCA, crustose coral ones, are dominating. Definitely a um, clustering. So here I'm going to let Peter describe the next three slides to you because these are, are his babies. He worked on these statistics. Uh, well, not, not necessary, but, but we wanted to sort of continue to delve a little more deeply into uh, what factors might explain um, some of these patterns in the fish community in particular. And so this is, this is a technique for, for looking at uh, complex um, community level data sets um, and trying to uh, tease out what, what, what some of those environmental factors might be shaping the pattern that we're seeing in the community. So um, arguably, maybe a little bit more specific way of looking at what uh, Nicole just showed you. So you see that. Um, Coral diversity, you know, if you, if you remove Montempera from the equation and just look at coral, um, you see a very strong signature there, right, up, right across the top, in terms of its influence on, on what those fish communities look like. Um, some suggestion, nonetheless, though, that Montempera um, and possibly even the, um, you know, the macroalgae um, may also be, be affecting um, those uh, fish communities. If you look at uh, some of the potential environmental effects in the human communities in particular, um, we were very interested in looking at, because um, the, the, the communities in, in, in Iliki uh, have, there's, there's reef ownership, right? So, so the folks down at ASO are limited to fishing only at select basic reefs. You know, folks from Federal can't fish there. So, and because there are different sized populations in each of, each of these communities, and it, they're not, the, the effort is not spread evenly throughout the, uh, throughout the atoll. So we looked at a number of different factors, the jurisdiction of you know, who sort of controls that particular reef site, um, whether those sites were more oceanic in a sense. Also the distance from the nearest boat launch or the, the, and the size of the closest human population. And we looked at some other stuff as well, but you know, again, you see, you see a very strong um, effect of, uh, of, those, uh, of those human influences, of human factors in those fish populations, fish communities. Um, another way of looking at this, and we debated whether this is, we should use this at all, but uh, if you, this is an ordination just of, the, of some of the sites. Um, so you can see there's some separation amongst these different sites, the, the little black, uh, the little black circles with the, with the codes, the text codes. Um, so there's, here's how to interpret this, right? how to understand this. It's just like reading a topographic map, the contour intervals here, the green ones in particular, uh, relate to human population size. So if you look at, the, if you ignore the red, and just look at the green, this is kind of a peak right here, and it centers to some degree <coughs> around those fallout sites, that main island. Um, as it falls off, it tends to go towards some of these less populated um, or uninhabited sites altogether. Um, you know, as with many of these things, you're actually trying to, to, to integrate a, a, a large number of different factors. So it, it, it's, it's a little bit tough to see, but um, the red contour lines relate to uh, distance, the distance of that site to the nearest boat line. Um, and we think this is a really strong factor because, because of the price of gas. It's a, it's a significant expense for, for these folks to, to leave you know, their, their local community and go out to these places. Uh -oh. um, so, but, the, but the important thing is that both of, these, both of these factors, both of these vectors, that population and distance, seem to play an important role in terms of structuring this fish community. So I'll turn it back to Nicole and uh, talk more about this. So here's the jurisdiction, so you can see how complicated it can be. So one of the reasons why, when I first went out there and they asked me for a plan to help them out, I said, absolutely no way, because I mean, this is incredibly complicated the way they do everything. And I don't understand it, but they do. Well, one of the things that's complicated is the jurisdictions. You can't fish where you don't have a jurisdiction. So here we have um, Falala, you see, has access to its own here, but also all the way out here to the Turtle Island. So they actually <coughs> control most of the turtle hunting out here because they have control over those areas. Here's Federai, 
which has the largest and healthiest of the reefs, let's say healthiest in terms of fish biomass and like that. Um, so they really have those, they're the hot spot. So if people need fish, they go cozy up to people in Federa. Um, and then uh, here we've got the, so one of the smallest areas is ASOR. So ASOR often has to go and, and borrow access from somebody else because they don't have very much of jurisdiction. And then Mog Mog has a fair amount, that's these green ones. So these can also be fluid, which is why for us to keep a, a handle on it can be difficult. So for example, Moss was given to Falala because it was originally owned by Federi, but um, one of the um, uh, chiefs uh, slept with, uh, so one of the people from the island slept with the chief's daughter, which is not cool at all. And as a result of that uh, faux pas, they were given access to some of the fishing grounds. So they, they, create, they use fishing grounds also um, as a way of cleaning out and getting back to people. Um, so here's what we found then, just to summarize that one. Um, the reefs cluster by habitat type, the clusters relate to human influence. And <coughs> I push this right and then it goes. Um, fish community structures cluster in a very similar way, so it's really the signature of this way. It's about that Montipera and the next close to human villages. Um, we think that the fish assemblage is driven a lot by coral cover, which is also related to uh, um, proximity to the villages. And then fishing jurisdiction and location are likely drivers of fish community structure as well. So um, here, uh, what you can't see is that what I've written here is that this is really a combination of human and ecological drivers. So these are it's a couple system, I think it's much more clear. Uh, so here chapter three and the final chapter, applying findings to management. So I'm gonna to present to you some of the work that these people have been doing um, along with the work we've done in order to figure out what's happening with their fish. Um, so fish biomass, it turns out that herbivores are very important. So we'll take a quick look at that one. And some of the fish landing, the landings and then which trophic fields are hard to sit. The story isn't gonna surprise you, but I think what was surprising to us is that it actually, the story is told really cleanly with the data, and it corroborates exactly what the people say, and it corroborates with the larger region-wide databases. And so we think we have something really good here in terms of management across these remote islands, because they're still not in a place where Saipan and Guam are, which has been far harder hit. Okay, so here is the uninhabited and inhabited again, and you will see here this is fish biomass total, and, you know, so that's not a surprising story, right? So, so this is all about fishing close to home, right? This is about fuel costs and like that, fishing close to home. So they're hitting those reefs really hard. And um, these are the more remote sites um, over on these two ends. Um, so biomass of herbivores is a similar story. And you'll see at um, ASOR, which is uh, one of the village sites, the biomass is very, very low. At Mog Mog, the biomass is very, very low. And we'll see at, um, where's the UAR? There it is, Falala. So Falala is uh, the most populated, but it's an oceanic island. So we think it's getting more fish from somewhere. And, and the biomass there is still relatively high compared to some of the other sites. So the story here is, is actually not that these reefs are in, in terrible trouble. They're actually, they're doing okay, but we can see a signature that there's trouble to come. So I think that's why it's really positive for us, is that we can see that if they implement management fairly quickly, that the reefs are doing okay for the most part. So um, I just want to put this up here to show you that um, uh, abundance and biomass are really different, obviously. And you can have sites with a very, very low biomass and a high abundance. And this is a trend that is seen across the region in many places that are overfished where you get these herbivores that used to be large body, and now you're getting smaller versions of them, and their impact functionally on the ecosystem is very different when they're small. They don't take as many bites, they don't eat as many algae, it's just a very different impact. So looking at abundance is probably not the best way to do it. It's really about biomass and size. So uh, these guys have been leading um, the efforts to uh, calculate, uh, to measure all the fish landings and look at the uh, condition of the fish. And uh, this uh, guy over here, Bosco, he decided to make this into a competition. And that shot the, our landings uh, database up from 200 to what is now 35,000. <laughs> it's the largest landings database in all of the Federated States in that region that these guys are doing. So it's pretty cool. It's a, it's a very exciting database. And I'll show you some of the results of that. So we um, put them through some workshops on um, what to look for in terms of measuring the fish, how to do the measurements, um, how to look at the gonads and this kind of stuff. 
Um, uh, so when the catch comes in, um, here's Jacqueline explaining the differences between fish. And the one thing about working with fishermen is they love to talk about fish. <laughs> so the great thing is that they get these fish coming in and they just want to hear everything you have to say about fish. It's super cool. You don't have to sell a project at all. They're very, very interested in it. Um, and then they would have collected the data. So here you can see, well, here, herbivorous fish, parrotfish, and here you have uh, big canthers. Right, so these are all big piles of herbivorous fish, a few carnivorous ones, but the rest are herbivorous. And that's the story, actually. It's, it's about herbivory. So they measure all their fish. They've been collecting, here's some carnivorous ones. They've been collecting data for now a year and a half or so. And some of the challenges we've had with this, actually it's kind of funny, um, <coughs> Peter's been doing a lot of this work with the fishermen. So we have to find the Olympian name and then translate it right to, to what we would call it. Uh, which is not simple because, like in many places where the, the uh, language is not written, it's just spoken. So it's a very um, it's a rich language with a lot of descriptors in it. So what we call the orange band surgeon fish, they call it moor, but they also call it moorfatch. And the reason is because if it's a different size, it has a different name. If it has a different color, it has a different name. So they don't just call it a color moor, they call it something different. They're aware that it's the same fish. But for them, it seems obvious that you call it something different because it tastes different, you cook it different, I don't know, it's different, right? So it's been tricky for us to translate that in the database so for us to get um, the kind of data we need. So this is a picture of Micronesian wide. Okay, I, want to, I pulled this, I modified this from Peter Hauck's work. Um, so uh, this is Yap, Guam, Pompe, and the uh, Marianas Islands. So look at this. This is the whole region wide commercial fish. Herbivorous, these are herbivory. Here. Herbivorous, 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 herbivorous. So 70% of the catch is herbivorous fish, 70% of the catch is caught by spear gun. Of those herbivorous fish, 79% of them are caught undersized, under reproductive size. That's not a good picture, right, when you're looking at a fishery. So that's what's happening region wide, and we see signatures of this in Ulithi, which is why we feel really optimistic about moving towards management now because they're not yet quite at the places that some of these other islands are. Um, on Ulithi, um, about 50% of the catch is spear gun. About 50% is they're catching with the spear gun. And then um, this is all uh, herbivorous fish also. All the Farmina is herbivorous fish. This is dominated by um, herbivorous fish. So for sure the majority is the herbivorous fish. And these are Ulithian names, so I, I don't expect to know what they are. But this is the spear gun. This is herbivorous, 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 herbivorous. Herbivorous, this is the first one that's not herbivorous that they're catching. So it's again the same picture, it's all about herbivory. It's only when you um, talk about the uh, hook and line, uh, these are emperors. Emperors and snapper are what they're getting the hook and line. It's definitely not the main way that they fish. Um, so then what we're also doing with this database is we're able to share with them some information that we're getting from fish base. Uh, about the size of the fish that they're catching and its reproductive, uh, and its relationship to what is considered its uh, um, length of reproduction. So you see a couple of them here. This one is a small, so they're catching this one very small. So let me point out to them that maybe, maybe you want to pay attention to that a little bit. And the red ones here are all ones that are kind of close, kind of close. So this helps them because they don't, they don't really think about it in this way. They think about the fish they're going to eat tonight. So they don't really think about the fact that if you let that fish go to reproductive size, it's going to contribute more. Um, so here uh, is the very end here, and I'm going to wrap it up with um, resiliency. Right. So the question is, can some of these degraded systems be brought back, let's say? And I'm first going to say that the reefs we've been looking at, I wouldn't consider them really degraded. A couple of them are in not great shape, but the degradation is fairly localized. So with some management, it seems quite likely that that could be brought back. And that's been shown with the LTER work in Morea um, after we found a Thorns outbreak. Um, didn't take more than about five years for some of that system to start recovering, largely because of the current fish. So herbivorous fish declines have been linked to reef degradation and lack of resilience, but also resilience has been linked to their recovery. So that's some of the work coming out of Morea. Spear guns are linked to herbivorous fish take. It's a relatively new <coughs> phenomenon, okay? Spear guns are relatively new in this part of the world. So this is what I mean by diverse fishing techniques. There used to be 78 different kinds of fishing on Wolei Atoll. Now there are five. So you know that they're targeting way fewer species of fish with those five. 
Um, Yap State, which is autonomously governed, has relatively healthy reefs, but they're not immune to these paradigms. So this is where we're feeling very positive about some of the stuff that's happening here. So here's what um, is happening on Falala. So I'm not saying that this is anything beautiful statistically, okay? It's, 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 it's a simple bar graph. Okay, so bear with me on it. Um, this is when Falala decided to close some of its reefs. And this is herbivore biomass. This is a really crude look at the data. We don't think we have a good enough temporal signature here to say anything. But it's a suggestion. But what's really powerful is that when we talk to the people, they say that the closure of their reef has resulted in dramatic differences. So I just actually last night got off the phone with um, Junior, and he said to me, uh, we, uh, we just caught, uh, we just went fishing, and he caught a whole bunch of fish from uh, Palau from our closed area. So the first thing I said was, well, really that's closed. <laughs> Why did you get fish in that was a closed area? But turns out closed is not closed in this part of the world. Closed is closed, but when there's a party, there's nothing closed. <laughs> <laughs> Parties for everything you can imagine. Graduation from high school, baby, death, oh, you name it, it's a party that gets the fish. <coughs> so um, they did fish here, and he said that for the first time in 30 years, they've caught fish they haven't seen. And here was the most important thing. They shut down the fishing, it was all spear fishing. They shut it down after two and a half hours because they had caught enough fish. And he said that hasn't happened in, since any of them can even remember. So that's from them, right? So they see a change. We don't think we can quite measure it yet, but they certainly say that there's a difference. So here's what they did. Um, this literally happened before the wheels of our plane touched the, the, the runway in San Francisco. Really, they had already done this. It was amazing, just like that, they put it together. So here's that runway. This area here is closed to fishing, except for parties. <laughs> and uh, in this area, oh, and women can always fish at night. There's some things that can always happen. So this is what I mean by complicated. You know, it's, not, it's hard to measure because when they tell us excitedly that they close something, there's 10,000 exceptions to close. Um, so this is an area here that is open to fishing, but no spear fishing, no night fishing, no net fishing, and no parrot fish. So they're taking the message of herbivory seriously, and they've shut it down for that part of the reef, although other fishing is allowed there. Um, and um, so I have a, a, I just, he just got up the phone with me last night and told me that now the fourth island, which is Federai, the fourth populated island, has implemented management. It has the largest jurisdiction, if you remember that. So that was one of the southern parts of the lagoon. Um, they have closed all of their fishing areas to any spear fishing, any parrot fish, any Napoleon rats. And so if you know anything about this part of the world, it's those big hump and bump heads that are, are those iconic big fish that shut down the fishing not like fish anymore. So he did, they just did that. And when I asked them, what are you going to do about your people who need to eat? Because you, know, you can't just close reefs who need to eat. And he, first of all, he said, don't worry, we open them for parties, so it's all good for that. <laughs> and also, we don't close them all. And then, you know, in all seriousness, the, the chief looked at me and said, you know, I'm chief. That's my job. My job is to figure out how to make it work. And I have to think about the future, right? So I have to figure it out. i got to work through it. And he was really honest about that. So what we've recognized is that really the stewardship in this part of the world, and really probably everywhere in the world where people live, is all about them. So they have to lead. And once they're told what to do, you want to get a different outcome. So we really held back from telling them anything and made them move forward on doing this themselves. They were nervous about it. But once they did it, they completely embraced it. So now it's their thing, right? In fact, if they forget what we look like next year, we've done our job. That's the, we're out of there and it's successful, <laughs> then we've done our job. Um, so uh, this guy is proudly retiring his uh, net because it's one of those nets that catches the uh, herbivorous fish. Um, and uh, this is a quote from one of the chiefs uh, on the island of Asor here. So he says, um, we need to have a common understanding around management. He says this to his people. This so that everyone agrees and supports it. So one of the things that he's really calling for here is unity, right, from his people. Um, understanding the old ways and the impact of the new ways can help us protect the ocean for our children and their children. So here's the old ways. Marine protected areas, when I first went in there, they said to me, don't be bringing us your yeah, marine protected area stuff. You don't want to do that. Don't make us sign any documents. I don't sign away my reef. I don't want any of that stuff in here. And I said, don't worry, I'm not going to tell you to do whatever. But what are they doing for management? They're doing protected areas. They've always used them. This is part of what they've always done. Except 
we bring in a new model and we tell them what to do and they don't like that. So it's all about green protected areas. That's, that's what makes these reefs work and they come to that themselves. So once we were able to kind of bring that out of them, what did you used to do? What have you stopped doing? And what are the problems and the timelines? And you line all that up, they sit back and go, oh, yeah, yeah, it's not. So that's all about not closing those reefs anymore, and, uh, not uh, having the turtles go to some place anymore. So they're bringing those back. And the final comment that I'll make here is that there's a lot of um, lethargy, cultural lethargy in this part of the world. They are given food that isn't good for them. They are given money in some cases. And they sort of um, are riding on a welfare track in some ways, you can say. Not in these islands, because they're still quite traditional. But there is still some of that, some signature of that that goes on here. And what, what this project has done for these chiefs is you know, they're now not sitting under the trees chewing betel nut. They're like out there telling people how to protect reefs. And they're really excited about it. So they're really galvanizing their communities. They've re-implemented their councils now. They have a, a natural management plan they're putting together. So it's energized them culturally and in leadership as well as ecologically. So I think it's, it's been really, it's been really, I think, rewarding for us to see these communities kind of really rally around fish. It's all about fish, right? So, you know, Bibles have come and gone, and everything else is coming on here. But fish, they've always been a part of what they're doing. So as soon as you start talking about fish and reefs, you get all excited about it. So that's our story. Considering it's out there, it's 
It's, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of surprising. However, it's very important, and we have not really done much with sea cucumbers, mm. and they have uh, lines out their door. The Koreans and the Chinese are lining up to exploit those sea cucumbers. Literally every day they get invitations, and they don't know anything about the sea cucumbers, and neither do we, so we didn't really focus on that, but um, although they don't eat them, so there's some people very interested. Yeah. Gold is the, um, what's the dynamics of the human population? Is that, are they increasing in numbers? And has it been augmented by the fact that they're now being supplemented with different types of food that they normally didn't eat? So, in other words, if they they don't just have their fish diet, they potentially, the human population would be regulated by the number of fish, so the fish population. It's a really good question. If you ask them that question, they'll say absolutely. Population is increasing, I don't care if they're seeing babies. We'll say that right out, flat out. But if you look at statistics, they're actually not. <laughs> so I think what, what happens is that people are leaving. So kids leave, and they don't come back. And, and so part of this is because of the breakdown of a tradition where after a woman had a baby, she's actually required to live in a separate place from her husband until the child is old enough to take his head and see. So I guess it matters on how the person they don't walk. I don't know exactly what that means. But so there was that, that was definitely difficult <coughs> because they have issues with food. Um, that's no longer practice, and so they say the birth rates are up, but the population are saying, well, what has changed is high schools came to the Outer Islands, and there's only two high schools for all of the 500 linear miles in the Outer Islands. And so the kids all come to those two islands. So the population on Falala goes from three, 400 to 1,000 during the high school time, and that puts a huge uh, stress on the resources. Um, so populations have changed by island because of those dynamics. Overall, populations appear to not be changing all that much in those outer islands. I think it's really about how the fishing practices are changing. And, and, uh, well, you're not making recommendations, but when you're showing that, you know, you're trying to get some sort of management and, and the, the chiefs have to buy it, and you're talking about the excitement of the fishermen. If you were to get their, the skin, get their real opinions, what do they think about the chief saying, you know, the chief saying, it doesn't seem like what's the real story of that? Are they truly buying or are they So this is like, this is a super important question. Because you know, it's easy to go in there and, and get the social data by talking to a few people, right? And then you that's the picture. You've got, you have to dig into the community because you have to see what's really going on. And we've tried really hard to do that. Unfortunately, to be able to do that, we've had to abandon all the good social science data collection techniques. <laughs> right? So to, to do this well, you have to survey form and have to all be right so you can analyze the data statistically, right? No. You cannot show up with forms and tape recorders and like that with these people. So you really have to just go and talk. And the real story is, yes, every community has their disgruntled people. That, that old fat chief man who just sits and treats about all day long has no idea what's going on. Um, so there are those people there, but at the end of the day, they seem, I mean, you can tell me what you, you talked to a lot of fishermen, they are the minority, and they, at the end of the day, are willing to go along with it. They'll fish a lot, but then when it comes down to it, they will follow it. And the nice thing about these communities is you can't cheat, really. You can't go fish and poach, because, I mean, it's like, you're my cousin and you on the reef, and everybody knows everybody, right? So you cannot really cheat. And if you do cheat, there's no jails, there's no punishment like that. But if you cheat, what has to happen is that your family, uh, which has a specific pattern of lava lava, this is a female garment, the, the lava lava of your family gets hung in the men's house. Everybody knows whose it is, because every family has a different design, right? So that's a super shameful thing. And it's not only shameful, shaming you, but it shames your mother who made it. So um, that's a really strong deterrent. And so there's a lot of so compliance, I say, is very, very high. Um, and when, it, when there's cheaters, everybody knows who they are. So you can dig to that, too. So we did find, they told us that one of their reefs had been protected. And we jumped in. And the avatar put his head out of the water and said, no way, there are people fishing here. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can see it. Who's fishing here? He said to the boat driver. And the boat driver said, no way, that's protected. He said, no, it's not. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Okay. You're right. My cousin fished here. Sometimes? How many times a week does your cousin fish here? So then you know, he doesn't fish there a lot. So you, you can see these changes and everybody knows it. So once you gain their trust, you will actually tend to get the true story. But you have to gain their trust. And that's kind of the key. We also have to spend a lot of time drinking mildly alcoholic yeast 
Well, it's uh, after time. Um, I think we'll thank Paul the two of you for both coming and um, invite you to stick around for a little bit if anyone wants to talk to you. Thank you very much. That was great.